Hello, hello, dear hearts. Marilyn here with another segment of Wisdom's Way of Learning. And we have been talking about six applications of notebook records and recording. And I got through half of it in the last segment. And this time we're going to be addressing records of written work and records of projects. Let me know. Uh, if you are receiving some inspiration from this, I would really like to know. And so um, I'd really like to hear from you. If you're enjoying these videos, let me know um, uh, what you're taking away from them for your own life and for your children. I know that I have um, ex an extreme uh, number of examples to show you. And I've tried to collect them up around me. It's kind of hard to wade through it all, but I'm going to make an attempt to show you more examples of what I've been talking about regarding developing the learning tools in your children. Well, I'm going to um, begin with records of written work. Just as a real quick review, I had shown you last week I had addressed um, the first category of notebooks, which is um, just composition notebooks for um, copy work, learning the handwriting practice, um, manuscript, and cursive. And I was showing you my own children's notebooks. This is two kids' worth of notebooks spanning probably about four years of um, various types of copy work and uh, writing and spelling um, practice. That's what this is. And then I, I also went into um, uh, describing another application of notebook recording, which I call booklet building. And this is just, you know, my children's booklet building. And I went through a bunch of these and showed you examples of some of them. I initiated most of these were self-initiated. But, of course, they also, some of them, they were done on their own. But some of them they just needed some help with. But they were self-initiated. But I began the concept for them by initiating uh, certain types of notebooks so that they would want to get in the habit of, you know, booklet building, writing, um, making memories in books. And so that's how I started that, laying the foundation, you know. And then I also went into collections, and my children collected nature. And so that's what my children's collections consisted of. And these are records that... Um, I helped them begin so that they would have a record of their nature collection. And, I, you know, that didn't continue forever. These ideas are to get them going in the recording habit and in lots of writing activity in everyday life so that your kids don't shy away from it. When you're... Um, uh, helping your children to write about their real life. You see, what happens is that they, um, they're they not having to uh, live in content that's meaningless to them. They're able to live in content that means something to them. And the idea is to develop learning tools, not, not feed them a whole bunch of content. Content is much easier to feed them, subject matter. It's much easier to feed them in other ways, like through um, reading books with them, um, having them listen to audio tapes. That's what that's what I did. To, it was tapes, but you know, audios. Um, I had them listening to audios so that they would be able to uh, lots of, you know, just absorb lots of knowledge and information that way. And it was always something I wanted them to learn. And so it was values and morals and Bible and history, America's Christian history and those sorts of um, subjects. 
And so it was much easier to impart knowledge to them that way in addition to just having conversations around the dinner table and as we went about life. But as far as learning tools and developing those skills, I wanted it to be easy for them. I, I wanted them not to have to deal with foreign material. I wanted it to be meaningful so that their love of learning would be nurtured and they would want to um, develop their learning tools. And that's what happened. That's why I'm showing you these. I didn't know what my children um, children's bents were back then. It's only in later years I could see the patterns unfold that there would there would be a, this repetitious um, bent towards something like my daughter actually wanted to write. I didn't know that. Um, my son actually wanted to build. Here's I just found this picture um, this morning. Um, we had a bunch of firewood starters dumped off at our place and he built a hut out of it and he was building lots of little um you know this he could go inside of this a picture of him poking his head out inside but he built all sorts of different little um um you know just little dwellings huts and cabins and and forts and things like that. Well, you know, sometimes you just think that those are phases that children go through. But in John's case, it wasn't. He actually built his family's cabin that they, they live in. He did an amazing job of it. Um, it's beautiful. I didn't know that he had those kinds of capacities inside of him. Just like Catherine with her writing. I showed it to you once before, but she wrote that essay um, comparing uh, the War of the Wizards. Um, she wrote that essay and, and she wrote all these true life stories, Adventures with Nature, and published that when she was 17. Um, you know, when the kids have these bands, in their younger years, you don't necessarily recognize it as something that's going to go with them. There were lots of interests that my that kid that my kids had that came and went. You don't know which ones are going to stick with them. You see, and so that's why it is very important that you don't minimize. Um, the types of activities that they're drawn to because you don't know what what that is for, how that's going to contribute to their future um, direction and path and vocation. You see, the things that they like to do the most are going to go with them, but you don't know that when they're little. And so you really want them to be able to explore lots of different avenues of interest as much as possible while they're young. And you don't want to frown on simple projects and, and things like that. For instance, you know, my son is actually a natural born engineer. Uh, his dad is too. They're naturally they naturally have engineering um, cap capabilities. And he was always wanting to build, um, we lived on a river at one time, and he was always wanting to build um, dams and, and reroute you know, just a little tiny piece of the little tiny section of this, the stream that was near the river and always wanting to do things like that when he was younger. And he built an elevator once that went into the ground, underground, that he raised up on a pulley in order to make a movie. I mean, it was a movie set. Um, and where a person could come up Indiana Jones style, you know, come up out of the, out of the ground. 
he wanted to engineer road system. Now this is, you know, this is just on a big piece of plywood, um, uh, stretched across two sawhorses. That's how big it is. Okay. It's just, a uh, small enough to do and big enough to, you know, have fun with. And he figured out how to make roads. He used glue and charcoal briquettes and, you know, crushing them and all sorts of stuff anyway, just to figure out how to make roads. And things like that, he just was always um, figuring out how to do things and making things. He was also a great experimenter. And this isn't going to look like anything, but it's dish pans that we used to use for storage. And he used four different types of soil and or fertilizer. I don't remember what this is. It's grass of some sort. And he wanted to see, you know, it's an experiment. See which one was the healthiest. That's how he did it. And of course you can see what happened there, but I can't tell you what this is about because I don't remember. I don't even know if he would remember if I showed it to him today. But um, that's just one of the many experiments that he did. So he was always experimenting and and making different um, structures out of different kinds of material. He made all his own props for movies. Um, <laughs> He figured out how to make a mask. Yeah. <laughs> this is him <laughs> getting ready to be masked. And there's the mask. And he's got straws coming out of his nose so he can breathe inside the mask. <laughs> it was it was going to be a prop, which was then painted to look like something. I can't remember exactly what that one was. But Okay, so I'm just showing you some things, miscellaneous. They don't, they don't appear to be much of anything, but you just don't know where your kids are going, you see? And so you don't want to, they are developing skills in all of that sort of thing. You know, my daughter was working right alongside John in building a fort, and this is Catherine, working on building a fort, you know? They they built a whole fort and a tree house together and engineered a pulley with a basket on it to pull things up into the tree house. Um, John was probably 11. Um, Catherine was, you know, 10 or 11. Catherine was 14 or 15 there. And, and um, they just did lots of those kinds of things together. Um, Catherine wanted to draw and she eventually painted and she also went into sculpture and I didn't know she was going to do those sorts of things you know at one time and I had shown you the pictures of, of the picture of Catherine standing next to the mural that she painted on the um, this is on the wall of the feed store in the town where we lived. And at the same time she was doing that, she and John made things to sell. And Catherine's idea was to make paint saws because it was a rough feed store, you know, that kind of a thing and kind of a place. And this is a saw that she painted and sold at the feed store. Here's an, here's the uh, quote, whole shot of it there. Here's another one. I got to keep this one. I, I really like the church one. I'm trying to get this so that you can actually see it. And so she painted saws and then John, he made um, birdhouses. I've got a couple pictures here to sell at the feed store. That's what he did. Uh, he was probably 17, you know, when he was building these. Just birdhouses. 
and they sold their things at the feed store. It was just something to do then, you know, because we were very uh, immersed in our friendship with the people who owned the feed store at the time. Um, Catherine went on to painting, and of course that wasn't something I knew she would do. This is a painting, and that's actually a picture of the painting. Um, these are pictures of large paintings that she did, and they're watercolor, watercolor paintings. Um, she did other things for gifts. These were large, uh, you know, print type um, framed. These were framed, you know, that she did for friends as gifts. Um, she did sculptures. Um, I'm not sure what, yeah, here's one. She made a sculpture of somebody's favorite dog and uh, on a stand and got all the markings exactly right for them as a gift. And um, she did other sculptures as well, very true to life sculptures. So I'm just trying to encourage you to, you know, in the younger stages, you don't know what your children are going to do. So in their amateur attempts, uh, in their play, which, which you just think of as play, think of it as their work, it's their learning, it's their, it's their, um, um, preliminary skill development stage before it's going to look like anything. You see, you don't know what it's going to look like. And so you don't want to frown on it. You don't want to think, oh, that's just amateur. I want to show you um, an example of what I could have done with that. Um, um, like when I, when I told you that John would make these little huts, um, I want to show you one. And this is, you know, just small. Actually, I still have this little house. Um, he knew that the perspective was off. The measurements weren't exact. Uh, he knew it. He was only 10. And he said, I made a house out of cardboard. It was hard making uh, the pieces just right. It was fun painting it. And so he knew that it wasn't exactly accurate in dimension to fit it right. The, you know, that it wasn't accurate measurements, but he was 10. And that's what he, he was trying his hand at building. You see, you just don't know what they're going to do. So you want to make sure that every effort is encouraged and that they are able to take the time to continue to develop their skills, you know? So today, I'm going to get into more records, but I'm also going to get into records of written work first. Um, now these records, it wasn't designed to be a memento, a place to just keep mementos. It actually kind of became that. The, I got the idea of records of written work because back in the, uh, 70s and 80s, we wrote letters, <laughs> you know, snail mail letters. And I taught my children to write letters. And so they wrote letters to their grandma and their, you know, um, their cousins and different ones. They wrote letters. And, and so um, I actually have all of those. My mom gave them back to me recently. And I have a whole packet of letters that my children wrote to her over the years, which is fun. But in the meantime, what I did, um, I didn't start this until, um, you know, they were certain ages because I didn't have the revelation right from the beginning. But as soon as they were, as soon as I got the idea for the notebook method, I started collecting their writing in a notebook. So anytime they wrote a letter uh, to a friend or to Graham, they, I made copies of it. I went to the copy store and made copies before I sent the letter off. And so this is, that's what this is. 
this is a notebook of Catherine's, primarily Catherine's letters to other people, along with pictures that she sent to them or copies of pictures. There's also some instruction sheets at the back that she wrote that she would send to her friends. And so she has a category of letters, one of stories, and one of uh, instruction sheets and I had her make her own cover letters and stories I added the instruction sheets later as she got older because she started making instruction sheets so letters and stories by Catherine Houshel then John his isn't as full but it's full enough you see it's full enough he actually wrote letters to Graham, he wrote le letters to his friends, but he also wrote letters to magazines to ask for inf information or to submit, actually Catherine did too. She submitted things to Nature Friend. She was published twice in the Nature Friend uh, magazine back then. I don't know if Nature Friend is still around, but it was around for a long time, 20 years as far as I know. Um, most of Catherine's, you know, growing up, she she got that um, magazine and submitted things to it. And John wrote letters to uh, catalogs to ask for information, or magazines to ask for information. And so that's what's in his. And I also added an experiments log uh, for him because he was always doing experiments. And so you can see here just letters and and it was something that just grew over time. You see one of his younger ones, younger letters. Uh, it just grew over time. And this cover he made with this pen that he made. It was an ink pen that he made and wanted to use it to make his cover. He wanted to see how a pen was made. And I don't even know what he used to make that anyway but he was always wanting to make things invent and and experiment with things and so of course that's what he wanted to do so those notebooks actually became keepsakes it didn't start out that way it's a place to keep various types of written work that don't fit in any other notebook category Letters, stories, experiments, logs, instruction sheets, whatever it is that is common to one of your children. Logs and journals fit into this category. Um, a family camping journal can go in there. Uh, just different types of written work in the same notebook, you know, using the divider tabs to make sections. Then when a section grows too big, it can be removed and placed into its own notebook. And this will probably be necessary for the letters section. First, at least it was for my children, as it seems to be the most frequently utilized written work. At least at that time it was. I know that's not the case today. <laughs> you can always print off um, your children's earliest computer work. You know, something to keep for them showing uh, the progress that they've made in their writing. I would prefer children write by hand on paper until they learn fluency before spending a bunch of time on the computer. Uh, so John's Letters and Stories Notebook Binder grew to contain 14 pages at the time of this writing and had been under construction for two years. And then the additional section of the for the experiments long. Catherine's letters and stories grew to 49 pages uh, at the time of this writing and had been developing for three years. And she had an additional section for instruction sheets that wasn't counted. And so these pages consisted of one to two pages each and are beautifully illustrated and colored step-by-step -step instructions about how to do something. Those are the instruction sheets. And those included how to take care of your salamander, how to attract birds, what to do with the feather collection, how to make a plaster cast of animal tracks, 
how to make milk carton birdhouses, how to preserve a spider web, how to mount butterflies for collecting. John made one, how to make a flagpole out of a tree log, you know, a skinny tree log. Um, later, we formatted those instruction sheets into a nature projects book and made it available for other homeschooling children through our product catalog. Another category that unfolded in Catherine's life was scripts, and that's actually included in her Letters and Stories notebook because she wrote a script for a children's play, and then she wrote two parable skits. And all and this is when they were children, and all three she produced with her brother and a few friends. So that's only the beginning of a, of a new interest. You see, um, we didn't know where any of that would go. Eventually, as they were older, they did write scripts for the movies that they were making. And so it became something in their life after a while. She wrote a script for Pilgrim's Progress, a movie that they wanted to do. Um, that was a long-term project that actually never got finished because of growing up and getting married and, you know, as life goes on. But things just kept going for them. Um, but when a child has developed writing as interest more fully, you can combine the booklet building approach of childhood with the written work that has been kept in a notebook. And you can help them format individual stories on the computer into small two to four page books. And I had shown you how I had helped Catherine do that with some of her stories. And I'm, here's the first one I helped Catherine do. It was about the flying squirrel that came into our house. <laughs> the Mysterious Flying Mammal. And... Then I helped her to go on and do, and there's just this little two pages, The Miraculous Chicken Story. It's just a little booklet. These are, color, you know, these are just copies of the original books. And so you can, you can see what that looked like. When will I see a buck? And it was suddenly sunny. They're just two page stories, you see, with a little illustration. And so when she had enough of that you know she was wanting to write stories so I took it a step further you see and that's what you do you take things a step further and you let them figure out how to do this stuff this is a picture of her original the first time she tried to make the book look like a book that was the cover the Mis adventures with nature the mysterious flying mammal and when I saw that she wanted to do that, and she asked me, she wanted to put it into a real, look like a real book. And so I helped her to do that. So when your children are growing up, you know, they're giving you indications all along the way of what they're wanting to do. And even if it's amateur, you're wanting to help them move that skill along and build it into something better than it was before because they're developing their skills. And so all you need is a cardstock cover and a, an illustration, and there you have a little book. So Catherine was about the ages of 12 to 14 when she wanted to make real books that way. And I showed you the book building before, and you saw how she um, just did by hand her own little booklets. But she wanted real books made on the computer with um, the stapled binding and, made, and all trimmed on the edges just like mom was doing with her books. And so that's what we did. And then um, she always kept them short. She wanted them short. And that's what ended up com coming into True Adventures with Nature. Short stories, true life stories of her and her brother's adventures with nature. Um, so eventually those things go somewhere. You know, her true adventures with nature's 28 true stories accompanied by 32 illustrations and that she did herself. And that was a real accomplishment for a 17-year-old. Um, as far as I, I think it is, um, 
when Elijah Company was selling my book and they heard about Catherine's book, they wanted to feature hers as well. And so uh, they sold many copies of her to Adventures with Nature. Actually, I think we sold probably 700 of them. And that was just featured in the nature section of their catalog. You know, uh, life science section of their catalog. So as you can see, records of written work, if you develop that, and you can you can see that John didn't do as much writing as Catherine. It doesn't matter. What matters is that he did, and that he developed some writing skills, and that he didn't shy away from it. The, you're wanting to keep writing about real life in front of your children so they don't shy away from expressing themselves through the written word, you see? And and also because a written word, it blesses other people. Um, you don't need to keep, you don't want your children to grow up just keeping all their thoughts to themselves, you see? You want them to... Um, learn how to process out loud and and bless others and I have um, pretty reserved children my family's all really reserved and so it was a big deal for them to do the things that they did and and still do today um, sometimes a child's diary or spiritual lessons journal if they're really drawn that way can be kept kept in a different type of notebook um, Catherine did keep a journal when she was a little bit younger and as she got older she was reading some of that to John and he decided he wanted to start keeping a journal and he did. He typed his because he was older at the time I think he was like 18 or 19 and he typed a daily journal for four years before he stopped doing it. All right you can purchase hardbound um, gift editions of journals in the you know anywhere and Catherine did keep one she kept a hardbound next to her bed of poems and songs that she wrote and then in later years she kept a work journal on her computer which recorded her apprenticeship season at a horse facility and then um, John kept a record of his coin collection in two places one on the computer and in a special record of its own that he could carry with him to the coin store. He also kept a flat notebook in his Bible for his self-initiated Bible studies. So you see there's a lot of writing there and you do want your kids uh, remembering to take writing into everyday activities because that's where it counts. It doesn't count. How many workbooks do you keep? Ever. Nothing got kept of my life in school except the report cards. Not a single project got kept. Not any writing, not anything. I had my first grade writing, my very first grade, that's what my mom kept. And all those years in school and high school and graduation, nothing got kept. Not a thing. I don't know if that's common. Um, in most homes of people who go to school but my house is filled with my children's lives because they had full rich lives you know and my grandchildren they're getting full rich lives give your children a full rich life uh, meaningful assignments my I want to get this out of my house and get it to them because they're always coming in getting something to show their children or the grandchildren are coming and asking me to see something that daddy or mommy told them about you see and I want it in their place uh, I feel like I'm going to go through and make copies of their notebooks so I can give them their notebooks because I still need this stuff just to show my audience you know so show, get your kids into real life, doing real life things. I grabbed a couple more pictures of Catherine's. I had shown you um, a really difficult picture there a while ago, and this is a better picture. It's actually a copy of a picture of a painting. <laughs> so it's a big painting, 
and I took a picture of it and made a copy of the picture for this display. And that's what this is. This isn't a painting. It was just on a regular sized piece of paper. It was a drawing. And this is a color copy of that drawing. And this is also a drawing, which I just saw is really sweet. I love Catherine's horse drawings. They're beautiful. And paintings. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go into talking about projects. Unless you have questions, if you have any questions at all about records of written work or how I did things, please ask because it will help trigger my memory on how I did things. Play is the highest form of research. That is so true. Yes, my children were very, very um, reference research oriented. They... I learned how to do that. That didn't come naturally to me, but I learned how to do that because of the original thought that God stirred in me toward lifestyle of learning and having to come up with original ideas to express real life. And of course, nothing is truly original because it all originates with God. But when you have a culture that you're surrounded by that has nothing to do with reality or very little to do with reality, it feels like original thought because you're working so hard to conceive it. Um, my son is the same way. Um, I, I uh, spent years writing Wisdom's Way of Learning, spent four years writing that book. And that's a book that we're talking about now. Um, it was really hard to get concepts into words and a, a sense of things that I had, you know, a gut sense of things and have to form it in a way to express it so other people could understand it. Uh, when you're not educated, you know, um, that was my education. That was my self-education. So... Um, when you have, you know, your children are released to be able to do lots and lots of exploring, research is part of all of it. I've heard that quote before, by the way. I'm not sure where I've heard it, but I've heard it a number of times. Place has form of research. Um, it is so, so true. Um, all right, so records of projects. And, of course, the projects... Are research in themselves because they didn't have a class to be taught how to do things. Um, that just didn't happen. Um, my kids' projects were all on their own initiative, figuring things out as they went. And, and it's a lot of projects. It's a lifetime of projects. Um, just like Catherine's painting. Now, she watched the um, who is that guy? Bob Ross, I think it was his name, um, on television watching him paint. In fact, her very first painting was an oil painting that she did for me. And that's a small picture of an oil painting that's on my living room wall. Um, that is kind of Bob Ross style. She didn't care for oil and went on to do acrylic only. And she didn't do a lot of painting. Um, I can count probably on two hands the paintings she has done. And less than two hands. And so that mural was a big deal for her to, to do that mural when she wasn't an avid painter to begin with. She drew. She loved to draw. That is what she did, and she used colored pencils at times to do, do her drawings. But, uh, yeah, Bob Ross style. And she always thought this painting was funny looking because of the Bob Ross influence on that. But I just think it's beautiful. All right, so in the projects, uh, record of projects, and I'm going to use John as my example here because... At the time, 
when John was 10, Catherine was 14. And as you can, you could see, Catherine was already doing uh, much more writing than John. And so I didn't have to create projects for her to write. She created them on her own at that age. Um, I did help her create the bird book, her first really big notebook, um, to put a collection in and for more research uh, activity in her life. Anyway, but for John, I needed to create something for this four month season for him to really overcome all of his writing hesitancies. And, and so I used this idea that, that the Lord gave me as just to a two book set, a record of projects, volume one and volume two. And what I did was I compiled photos from the age of seven to the age of 10, including some that he was working on at that time. So there's um, four years worth of photos of little projects that he had done that I happened to take a picture of, okay? I collected them up, I made these notebooks, and I, um, with this, I made lined paper on my computer and I went through, I didn't tell John I was doing this. I went through and I started mounting photos. Here's some Legos that he did. And I started mounting photos in the book just to get it ready. And then when I, um, you know, different things that he was doing, drawing um, plans for, things that he wanted to make, um, and actual um, projects, um, working on the tree house before it got put up in the tree. Anyway, so I put all these in this notebook, in both of these notebooks, a little sewing project that he did. And then I introduced the idea to him because I knew it was going to be a big deal. I knew he wouldn't want to do it. And as soon as he saw all of that blank paper right there, see, he got overwhelmed. And because it was hard for him to do, you see, and he got overwhelmed and I said, I tried to find, I'm trying to find this one page here and I'm not sure where it is. Um, well, I don't know where it is. Um, he had a plaster cast of his foot and I went to that page and I said, all you have to do is write two words, my foot. And he just breathed this huge sigh of relief. All right, there's that little house I was telling you about that I showed you pictures of and he wrote about it here. Um, I said, this is going to be your writing practice every day. You know, so he would have to form his own sentences. This was a puzzle that he made out of cardboard. He wanted to see if he could make a puzzle. This is a Where's Waldo puzzle that he made. And it was a really big, big piece of cardboard. Um, two feet long, you know, that kind, that's about that size. He had a collection, his can top collection that he had strung and measured and wrote about that. You see? And um, different little mechanical things that he made that he wrote about. Um, there's so many in here and it's very difficult to hold these up to you. But the idea, I'm just trying to give you some ideas. Um, they don't have to be much of anything, you see. just It just needs to be important to your child. It just needs to be important to them. And you know, when John got into that, he it didn't take very long before he was enjoying it. I don't think it took two days. 
when he realized he got to write about his own things. And so these were all completely unrelated projects. You see that. Um, they were created through a variety of mediums, such as stitchery, cooking, crafts, building, and experiments are all in these notebooks. And I used this type of um, application quite a bit with John because he was constantly engaged in a variety of projects, inventions, and experiments. So he filled these two notebooks with 42 projects and wrote about each one. And he started to increase what he wanted to say. Now, I would say, well, now you can say something more about that project. And he would say, but I don't know what to say. And I said, well, tell me about it. And so he would tell me about it. And I said, well, that's what you say. And then it just like a light bulb went on in his head. Oh, that's what I say. Just like I'm telling someone else, I'll write that down. And that's what he did. And he didn't struggle with that ever again. I just explained it that simply to him. I, you know, I told him to tell me about the project. And then as he, he did, um, after that, he knew that that's what he would write about. He would write what he would say to someone else. So then another idea for a notebook to reflect a specific theme of specialization, such as a girl's collection of several sewing projects, complete with photos of finished items, along with fabric swatches, patterns or drawings, or a collection of woodworking projects that a boy engages in over a period of time. And I've got a couple of those here um, that John did when he was younger. He made a little stand for his miniature TV to put on his bedside table. And that was the drawing of it. And that's what his specifications were of how to make it. And he painted it white. And I do have a picture of that. I'm just not knowing where that is. And he also made himself a money box for keeping his money in. And that's, that's just what he wanted to do. And so he did make some things. This is a hand-carved pen set. It says Mom on there. And um, it's just out of a piece of oak that he found. And the pen. And he actually has a pen in there. But what's really special about this, I have to show it to you. This is a little... I don't know, chestnut thing, top of a, he put this in here. This is a note. This is an I love you note to me. This is made out of metal tube and he put a hole in it. You see that? And put a little scroll in there that says, I love you, mom. It has a date that he made it and gave it to me for Christmas one year. This is precious. He also made me a carved, hand-carved walking stick. And, yeah, he did a hand-carved uh, hand chain out of wood. And so he did some projects, but he wasn't avid in, in making tons of things of, of one kind of thing, you know. He just never did that. He would do something one time and he would move on to doing something else because he loved to experiment. And so he was always um, in experimenting with things, making different things. He did um, some outdoor projects, experiments. This is a little cap stove that he made. He's 10 here. And found a grill to put on top of it and roasted weenies over it. And he was very excited to build the first fire in it. <laughs> and here's the grill. 
on top of it. He just found parts in an old shed on the property where we live. And he made a leaf shredder. And didn't know at the time that he was actually inventing something that would be invented a few years later called a lawn debris shredder. That's what he did. He invented a lawn debris shredder. And there was this little project. And there's some of the leaves. that He used a fan blade and motor to um, make it work taped it all together. He was 10 there. 10. Okay. That's what my son wanted to do. He wanted to invent. And he was telling me the other day, he seems to always invent things that always get inventive right after he has the idea. And I said, I used to tell you always got really good ideas. And, um, he does. He gets really good ideas from the Lord. And um, he wants to invent something and be the first to invent it, you know. <laughs> it's funny. He just gets good ideas. Anyway, so you can do this with um, any interest. Any interest. You can include photos and documentation of pertinent information. Um, you can have photo documentation of the different stages of completing a single project that can later be directed into the creation of an instruction sheet that will serve a dual purpose just to give the child more writing practice so that somebody else can do the very same thing that they did. So while your children are doing these kinds of projects and also writing about them, they're not only their analytical skills are developing, but their composition skills are further developed. And then an instruction sheet can be shared with friends, you see. And so there's a lot of going on. There are lots of skills going on. Development of skills. Um, let me see. Some ideas my children pursued in the past include the photo documentation of a pet stages of growth. Um, Catherine did that quite a bit. Um, John did photo documentation of the steps of skinning a small mammal. Um, I have those pictures here around me. I'm just not going to try to find them again. <laughs> um, he also did a photo documentation of the steps taken to make an animal track, a wild animal. And Catherine and John both did that one. Um, the stages of a vegetable garden. Uh, so there's lots. You could do a pet notebook. My kids did a pet's notebook where they put pictures and the names and the dates of all of their pets that they've ever had. Um, that At the time, anyway. I mean, that's not updated <laughs> at all. So there's so many different um, ways you can do a project notebook and those are such just a few those are just the ones that my family did there's so many other interests you know and that is all that I actually was going to talk about today I wanted to go into the unit of life book project with you and I felt like that one could probably be its own um, video uh, next week because it's just a little much you know I think it's a little much you can't put everything in a notebook it's too much work the idea of the notebooks is so that you your children learn how to write and they don't shy away from it and it gives them an opportunity to develop their learning tools um, when your children are very purposeful in life, um, you can never keep up with it. You can't keep up with um, uh, the amount of time, uh, the, just the sheer number of projects. And there's not enough time in life to record everything, you know, other than make a note of it. My son was really into survival skills 
And so here's a couple pictures of him building uh, little beds in his, for his camping that he did. Um, here's a... He would just go out in the woods behind us and do this sort of thing. And he had a... In the tree... <laughs> he had a hammock in the tree... Uh, so he just did different kinds of things to keep off the ground uh, so that, it, you know, the different hostile bugs wouldn't get to him. And then he would invite his sisters to come to the campfire and they would have a campfire. And he would roast uh, grasshoppers and they would eat grasshoppers <laughs> learning how to survive and he also made a steam water purifier thing uh, from the water in the creek just he did all kinds of experimenting that way just wanting to know how to survive just for fun you know and he had a kit that he used all the time that was attached to his belt of of miniature tools that in case of an emergency he would have what he needed um, he just did those kinds of things and so with um, his inventions between his inventions his experiment his projects and the survival things and the building that he liked to do um, he really did have a lot to write about this is an experiment he did with eggs, standing them on end. Now this is during the equinox. He, he had heard that this would work and he wanted to stand them on end during the equinox and it worked. And they are not stuck with tape. They're just standing on end. I didn't believe him, but he showed it to me. He said, come on, this is going to work. And it did. <laughs> Never heard such a thing, have you? No. This is a familiar picture. My kids with their daddy. When they were little, Jim had a red beard and, a, and black hair. <laughs> and we are gray today. But he had them on his lap a lot. They did a lot of um, reading together. He read to them. Uh, this is a picture of Catherine and John as they were growing up. And, oh, here's a picture of John doing some copy work from the Bible. And that little desk that is in his cabin for his oldest son, Sammy, is using that now. Um, John's great-grandfather made that desk and stool. All right. I love this picture is sitting on a hay bale out in the field. All right, well, I'm going to quit showing you pictures and <laughs> let you go. Ladies, love on. Your precious kiddos are so dear to the Lord. Let them become who they are meant to be and draw their hearts to you and teach them about Jesus, okay? I had the most wonderful visit with my daughter yesterday. She came, she saw me sitting on the deck and she came and sat down with me and she wanted to tell me something that she's been doing because she's writing this story and she, she found an assessment, a personality assessment that um, shows nine different personality types and shows what happens when a person chooses to grow what happens to their personality and how their personality starts taking on the positive traits of 
of some of the other personality types. And so, well, that's because that's the way Jesus is whole in his personality. And, and when we are made whole in our personality, we start to adopt personality traits that are all the best of every, every personality. And, and, and the, um, the bad traits are eliminated from our lives. And so we had so much fun going through them all and, and talking about ourselves, you know, uh, which ones we were. It was just fun time visiting with my daughter. You don't get to do that very often because, you know, the kids are real busy with their families. Even though we live together, we don't have the long visits like we used to. And it reminded me of the lunch times we had together because my kids would be so busy, but they always connected with me at lunchtime during the um during our work days you know when they were living at home we would have a good couple of hours together in the middle of the day every day and then again at night you know bedtime they'd be coming around and sitting on the bed and we'd be having time together and and that sometimes we would read together sometimes it was just talking but i'm talking about in the older stages of their development before they left home you know when they're older teens and 20s uh, we spent a lot of time together when everyone was in their own pursuits we still spent a lot of time together and yesterday reminded us both of those lunch times those long lunch times and oh my goodness i miss those days Spend quality time with your kids so they will still want to come around. Mommy's okay. Spend quality time with your children. Draw them to you with your whole heart so that they will give you their whole heart and you'll never lose their hearts, okay? Um, when you have these four um, activities that round out the learning process and I'm wondering if you can help your son understand that he is developing uh, some very uh, narrow a narrow he's developing along a, a narrowly defined path um, rather than in a whole he's not developing a whole um, whole abilities He's skimping on other areas of development and just focusing on the reading. See, the reading, and of course you already know this, the reading is easy. Taking in is easy, but putting out requires effort and character. And so you kind of need to address the character aspect and help them to understand that to put out in writing or in any kind of a project requires an effort whereas reading can be kind of a lazy activity you know it's a it's a relaxing activity it's not it's not productive it's only productive if you're actually going to learn something and do something with that but um in any case you're going to need to help him to understand that his development is important to you. And at his age, he's supposed to just do what you're wanting him to do anyway. And so, um, what I used to tell John is, you don't get a choice whether you're going to write or not, but you do get a choice of what you write about. I'm giving you a choice of what to write about, but you're not having a choice about whether or not you're going to play with your siblings, do some copy work, or write about something, you see? And so it's just that he's not inspired and that's the hard part your son isn't inspired and you want him to become inspired but you know when my son was writing on these projects he became inspired after he got going on it it wasn't first that didn't the inspiration didn't come first in that in that respect but his projects were inspired but to write about the projects? No. Eventually, he loved writing about his projects. And then he went on to want to write more. And he initiated a lot more writing projects 
after that, in the initial season was three months, and then he went on to initiate another month of his own writing projects, which is amazing to me. And I documented that. All of that progression and the details of that, there's way more details in this book than what I gave you today. John Halshaw's Record of Projects, and I documented the um, just what he did, you know, and what it was all about. Um, Mom's initiated pro uh, writing, and then John self-initiated writing projects, which took an additional four weeks. And so he was inspired, but he didn't start out inspired. You do have to compel your children to do something. So writing scripture is one, but you, okay, so he's 10 or 9. Um, my son didn't do a whole lot of writing, but he also didn't do any reading. I had to, I had to have him do reading every day. I had to have him do writing every day. So that's something that you initiate, Mom. And then you have to limit the reading time. And I limited, my daughter loved to read. And I limited her reading time to two hours a day. And then they have to do something else. And and uh, if you just limit, put a limit on the reading time, and then help him, oh, okay. When my children were were those ages, or actually they were younger than those ages, I put, I collected up on a list on my refrigerator um, options of activities that they could do all afternoon. And those were mom-approved activities. Reading was one, but there was a limit on the reading. So the reading, two hours. Okay. If that's what she wanted to do that day. But if she was engaged in projects, sometimes she wouldn't read that long. Um, but the, the activities were mom-approved activities. And so what I did was I took the things that I knew they were interested in already that were somewhat productive, and I put them on the list. And for four hours every afternoon, and I call this productive free time, for four hours every afternoon, they could only do the activities that were on that list. And that taught them to be productive. You see, your children are in training. And you need to teach them to be productive, not to just give into their flesh and always do the easy thing. Reading is easy. It requires no effort. You could even call it lazy. It requires no effort. You see, reading is a relaxing thing you do as a pastime. Uh, it's not productive unless you're taking notes for a project you're doing. You see? If it's just reading for pleasure, that should be totally curbed <laughs> um, with a limitation placed on it, a time limitation placed on it. And so get a schedule for your family of productive free time where during that four hours, they have these activities to choose from. Sometimes I would have a different list for my daughter than I did for my son, simply because they were interested in different things. But I think most of the time it was pretty much they crossed over um, because they worked on projects together as well. And that's the other thing. Your son needs to be playing with the other kids and doing something to contribute to whatever they're doing. He can contribute to what they're doing. You see, and eventually he'll overcome the boredom because it sounds like there's some boredom there, but you do have to impose some boundaries for him. Um, yeah, you need to impose some boundaries for your nine year old. Um, you know, the drawing, I'm wondering if it's because he just didn't want to go do the hard part of learning how to do it. Um, it didn't come easy. He might be interested, but it's not coming easy, and so he gives up on it. 
these are character issues in your children and so you really want to address that and help them to get past the hard stuck places in something you see you could do some drawing with him if he's interested in drawing uh, if he's interested in um, bird sightings or recording that you know just do it for a week and see what happens um, help your children to get over the hump of whatever it is they're having difficulty with because there might be a difficulty with their character in that and so I'm just throwing that out there I'm not saying that's what it is but I find that most issues with the children are character related issues that they have to overcome and honestly, a nine-year-old with a seven and ten, I mean, it's okay that he wants to read, but um, he really needs to be playing with the other boys. I don't see why not, honestly. So now that you're sharing, I thought about how he likes to help me cook occasionally, so I told him one day you could copy down a simple recipe, and he melted in the floor. I thought he would be excited about it. Hmm. Well, that's because you're having him do the hard thing of copying before he gets to do the fun thing of helping you in the kitchen. Copying down the recipe would be the table time, and but you need to be drawing them in because the activity is what you're writing about not the idea of the activity, okay? You're not having them write about an idea. You're having them write about something that they're loving doing. So make sure you're actually having them in the kitchen. And then you don't have a choice about whether or not you're going to write. Let him melt. But to make it easy for him, just like I did with John, he only has to write a sentence. And talk about how the family loved what he made you see uh, that's all you don't have to make it a big project and so if he's melting to the floor somehow he's feeling overwhelmed or uh, he hasn't overcome all the hesitancies yet and he needs your help to do that but make sure he gets to do the fun things of helping you cook in the kitchen, learning how to do something. If he likes to experiment, let him pull something together. My Jesse grandson, he's 13, he's upstairs just yesterday making cookies. And they're letting him experiment with his own recipes. You know, they're letting him waste ingredients and figure out how to do things you know he has a recipe and he's done some really good things but he's made a mess out of some things too okay so you're you're realizing that it's a character issue um and you, so you say we can do hard things and i really try to model that too yes that's good um yes chris to do the activity first <laughs> Yeah, the whole idea is for your children to enjoy doing lots of things and then bring that to the table, okay? You notice that I didn't make notebooks for my kids to fill in. I did that before I got revelation, before I was wasting their lives. See, when I was wasting their lives, I was creating the curriculum to put in a notebook. No. Then I let them do real life, and I brought that to the notebook. Something they already did. All the notebooks are things they already did that they enjoy doing. Okay? And I use that for writing practice. Okay? You're taking the fun out of it. That's school. Okay, you took the fun out of it. So it doesn't matter whether it's just scrambled eggs or whatever it is. 
You know, you took the fun out of it. Just let them enjoy being with you in the kitchen and experimenting. Don't turn it into uh, an assignment. Uh, you don't want to turn that into an assignment, a writing assignment in the kitchen. Yes, there you got the revelation. And so now what you're needing to do is repent to your son. You're trying to figure these things out. Just say, I was trying to figure these things out and I was going about it wrong. I don't want to squash your interest in anything. Um, you do have to write, but I'm going to go about it differently. And you're going to make it easier for him to overcome, okay? Because you want him to overcome and you want him to want to do it. All right. So, yes. The first day, he's not going to want to do it. But if it's a reasonable assignment, it's reasonable timing um, after he's had the fun of doing the projects, okay, then it will make sense to him. Uh, if you try to hurry the process, he will continue to balk at it. You want to make it easy so he will be the one to grow the process. He will grow it. That's what my son did. He went from one word to two words, to one sentence, to two sentences, to three to four sentences. And then he self-initiated a whole nother month of writing, another 400 and some words on his own. He even wrote about a spiritual metaphor, which wasn't easy. That's an abstract concept, you see, for a 10-year-old. And there was no way I would have been able to get him to do something like that at the beginning of that four-month season. I had to help him grow into it. You need to help your children grow to where they are actually initiating the growth. That's what you're wanting, okay? Just getting your kids to do things isn't going to work. All right. Yes, I've had many kids come to me at conferences and conventions crying in my arms in gratefulness. I have a whole bin full of, of um, gifts that kids used to send me. Um, children of readers used to send me gifts. And they wanted to come to my conferences just so they could meet me and thank me themselves. I got letters from children all the time. Just grateful for how I'd help their mommies. Okay, well, ladies, I'm going to let you go. I pray, Krista, that you get every one of those boys' hearts, that they hear your heart toward them, that they respond, and that they are willing to let you build trust with them again. If, if there's any trust broken, especially with that nine-year-old of yours, that he allows you to build trust with him again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to say goodbye now, ladies, and I will see you next week, same time. Bye-bye.